on the line today, veteran crew chief, Fox broadcaster, broadcast professional. There you go. Larry McReynolds. Once again, here's Mike Wallace. Well, Larry, my guys tell me I'm dragging it out too much, and we've got so much of your career we got to get in in a short time. So this final 15 minutes, I need to fast-forward motion of Larry Mack. So when did you get or where did you go that you start to think you made it in the sport and then uh, to bring us to present day? Yeah, you, you know, working for Kenny Bernstein, King Racing that started in 86, you know, worked there 86 to basically just the beginning <clears throat> of 1991. I would say, Mike, getting that first win with Ricky Rudd, at Watkins Glen in August of 1988, coming back the next year and winning Sonoma with Ricky. And then even 1990, you know, helping Brett, Brett Bodine get his only cup win at Wilkesboro. Uh, to win three cup races, even though it was only once a year, kind of made you feel like you, you, you're on pretty solid ground. But there is no doubt going to Robert Yates Racing, that was a career-making move. When I went there, Basically, race number five of 1991 with him and, and Davy Allison in that 28 car. That that was the move, I think, that safe to say it, it put old Larry Mack on the NASCAR map. Tell me, Larry, I've asked you to fast forward. Now I'm backing you up. What was it like? I am assuming Robert Yates called you, talked to you. How did you get hired by him or who did that? Because that had to be just an incredible experience. Well, actually, in 89... Davy and Robert both started hammering on me about coming over there. Uh, and Davy's Alice Allison sales pitch was Larry, the horsepower we've got. If you'll just help me come get this thing pointed, we will wear them out. And I actually took a job at the end of 1989, headed into 1990, and I got cold feet. I just felt so indebted to Kenny Bernstein because I felt like he had given me such a phenomenal opportunity when most people wouldn't do it because again i had never won a race not as a crew chief not as a mechanic not as anything and he gave me an opportunity with, with a fully funded race team headed into 86 and i had to call robert and tell him i couldn't do it well fast forward start the 1991 season we were so fast for that 26 car sat on the outside the pole at atlanta motor speedway but we, we just we couldn't get everything connected. We could get the car working good. We could get the aero good, and we'd have engine issues. We'd have, get the engine fixed, and we couldn't get the aero side of things. I just felt like we were a situation where we could maybe win one or two races a year, but we were never going to be championship contenders. And after the Atlanta race weekend, they had had a falling out with Jake Elder over there with Robert. And I was kind of wits in with what was going on with the 26 car. And Robert called me and said, I know you are loyal to Kenny, but I'm going to make a crew chief change this week. Are you interested? And I said, when and where do you want to meet? And we met and got things put together. That's outstanding. Congratulations on that. That that I do have to say with a little bit that I know about that stuff, that was a, an earmark moment in your career going going to that 28 car. No doubt. No doubt. It, and when I went back there in the dyno room and saw the first engine being dynoed, I went, holy crap. I've wasted about five years of my career. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it amazing when you go somewhere and it's got all the stuff and how much easier it makes it? <laughs> You don't have to work near as hard. <laughs> yeah, I, I had the opportunity to drive for Penske Racing for eight races back in 2000. It's like, wow, it's like I went to some cool driving school last, this week, and yeah. just everything's easier. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So what did you do after Robert Yates? Uh, most of the world knows a lot of the success you had there and the things were going on. What what, what was the what went on at that point? Well, I, I was there, you know, from the fifth race of 91 to the end of 96. And, and, and my gosh, you know, one races with Davey Allison, the 1992 Daytona 500, you know, came close on the championship in 92. And then, of course, we lost him when you least expect it in a helicopter crash, July 13th of 1993. We pick up the pieces. Ernie Irvin starts driving the car. Um, uh, 
the latter part of, of, of 1993, we win back-to-back -back races at Martinsville and Charlotte. We start 1994 off. We're winning, winning races, sitting on poles, leading laps. And when you least expect it, practice crash in Michigan in August of 1994. He's out for the rest of the year. Your brother was good enough to come in there and finish out the season with us um, of 1994, which was exactly what we needed. Kenny is such a positive and upbeat person and helping him get his first top five finish at Martinsville in the fall of that year. That was pretty cool. Dale Jarrett runs it in 95. We win Pocono. Ernie comes back in 1996. We win a couple of races, but I think Mike, as the 96 season was winding down, we started the second team in 96. And my gosh, I think between the two teams, we won six or seven races. Dale and Ernie both finished, Dale Jarrett and Ernie both finished top 10 in points. But I think with everything going through the Davy deal, the Ernie deal, starting the second team, as 96 was closing out, I was just mentally and physically wore out. It was nothing due to Robert. It was nothing due to Ernie. It was nothing due to performance. I think I just needed a clean sheet of paper. And about the time I was feeling that, that I needed this fresh start, here comes Dale Earnhardt and Richard Childress wanting to know if I'd be interested in coming and joining them for 1997 with the three car. Um, it was kind of a no-brainer. Not because <laughs> anything negative at Robert Yates Racing I just needed a fresh start. That's a pretty good fresh start right there. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so what was it like, your crew chief for Dale Earnhardt, top of the sport? What was that like? Well, it was pretty cool yeah. until I could not help him find Victory Lane. Mm. Um, you know, we went to Daytona. And I, we, we were in a position to win that thing with about 18, 20 laps to go. And that's when our car picked up a push. Jeff Gordon got into our left rear coming up off turn two, and he's barrel rolling down the back straightaway. But it, it wasn't that Dale and I didn't get along. There were so many things written about we, we were arguing, we were fussing, we were fighting. That was to the contrary. We just had very different personalities. Dale was very laid back. I I was a very high strung individual, and we just we just couldn't get things plugged together to get what we needed to win a race. And the man had a winless 1997 season. I thought I was going to have to hire a bodyguard to protect me because the Earnhardt fans were accusing me of sabotaging Dale's career. I was being accused of Ford sending me over there to sabotage Chevrolet. You have no idea. Really? What I was <laughs> you remember the Earnhardt fans? They have a little bit of passion, you know, back in the <laughs> yeah, day, especially did. especially when you, you go up. With my uniform on, because I'm telling you, people were serious about this whole sabotaging Dale's career. But the cool thing, after February, I think February 17th, 1998, I could have run for president and got some votes. <laughs> got him a win in the Daytona 500. Yeah. T tell me about that experience, Larry. Winning, you know, we, we bought, passed over the Davy Allison one, but tell me about winning the Daytona 500 as, as a crew chief and, and as a person. What, what is that like to you? Well, you know, yeah, winning in 1992 with Davy, you know, it was my first 500 win. It was Davy's first 500 win. It was Robert Yates Racing's first 500 win. I, I don't know what a, a coach feels like when they win a Super Bowl or a World Series. But I got to believe it's pretty close to it. But six years later, to go there with Dale Earnhardt, the man had won at Daytona 30-something times in, in Xfinity, in the summer race, the dual race, the clash, I rock. He just could not close the deal on the 500. And that car that we won the 500 with, we built that thing during the summer of 1997. By the time the calendar year of 1998 came around, that car had already been in the wind tunnel two or three times. And we'd already been to Talladega with Dave Marcus and tested it a couple of times. And the first time Dale drove it was 
the, the January test of 1998, and he loved it. The car wasn't brutally fast, Mike, but you being a race car driver, you'll understand this. When he would turn the wheel to go down in the corner, the car would not lose RPM. It maintained RPM even through the corners. Wow. And that's where the car is so good. And we got the speed weeks. It's almost like we could do no wrong. The, the slicker that track got, the deeper we went in through the week, it's almost like the better the car drove. And we were able to finally win it. He didn't promote how much he wanted to win it, but I knew how bad. Because right before they fired the engines and right before we clipped that window net, he got me by the collar and kind of pulled me in toward the window opening and said, you just get me near the front or to the leader when this thing's closing out today and I'll make their good day go bad. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like him all the way. <laughs> uh, again, congratulations on that. So after that, Larry, where where's your career go at that point? Hey, you've, you've just won the Daytona 500 with Dale Earnhardt. The season goes on, and um, where is it at at that point? Well, we go about a third of the way through, and he, honestly, even when in the 500, we kind of were back to where we we were you know, 1997, we just couldn't get the car to go around the corner for Dale. I couldn't. And fourth May after the Richmond race in 1998, the 31 car with Mike Skinner, Kevin Hamlin, the crew chief, they weren't running much better. In fact, that Richmond race, Mike and Dale battled their ass off all night long for about 20. Oh, wow. And I remember being in the, the minivan driving home with Linda and the kids on Sunday morning after Richmond and my phone rang and it was, it was Richard. He said, what you doing, pal? I said, well, we just left the racetrack. We're driving home. He said, what time do you think you can be at the shop? And I said, well, you know, should be able to be there in about four, four and a half hours. He said, uh, can you get Linda to drop you off here? And he said, I'll make sure you got a car to drive home. And I'm thinking, this is it. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm tired. But the good thing is, I think Richard had come to realization he had two really good race car drivers, Dale Earnhardt and Mike Skinner. He had two really good crew chiefs in Kevin Hamlin and Larry McReynolds. You know what? I think I just have a mix wrong. And he made the decision to swap Kevin and I, put me with Mike and put Kevin with Dale. Both teams were immediately much better. I was exactly what Mike needed. I was high strung. I would tell him to shut the hell up and just drive the race car. <laughs> Kevin was very laid back, which is exactly what Dale needed. And thank the good Lord, that's the way Richard saw it. 